this one's gonna be hard to watch. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. In today's highly requested video, we will be reviewing Amber Lynn Reed. Now, I have received so many requests from you guys to review Amber Lynn since I began this series, but especially since I did my review on Nikocado Avocado. So, similar to Nick, whose review you can watch right here, Amber Lynn's channel has been the subject of a lot of hate, a lot of bullying, and a lot of controversy largely to her extreme weight gain and the inconsistent nature of her content. And while it has taken me a long time to figure out how to best approach this video, I want to say that I think I'm finally ready. So today we're going to be taking a look at the evolution of Amberlynn's channel and her corresponding weight gain, my thoughts on her problematic mukbang content, and some of the reasons why dieting might be failing Amberlynn's weight loss goals. We will also once again be joined by eating disorder dietitian Alessandra Magisano to gain a little bit more insight into some of these hot topics. But of course, before we get started, a few quick disclaimers. Number one, the information in this video is for entertainment and educational purposes only, so you should always speak to a healthcare provider about your unique healthcare needs. Two, this video is not intended to diagnose or pathologize Amber Lynn. The intention of this video is to simply discuss the themes on her channel in an educational and compassionate format. Three, don't forget to please be kind in the comments both here and on Amberlynn's channel. Four, a trigger warning that some graphics and discussions may be disturbing to some of my viewers, particularly those who may have battled or are battling disordered eating. So of course, feel free to skip this video if that sounds like it could be you. And finally, do not forget to subscribe to this channel and ring that little bell so that you never miss out. Okay, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with Amberlynn Reed, she initially started her YouTube channel back in 2013 to document her weight loss journey. At the time, she was around 368 pounds. However, since starting her channel, she continued to steadily gain up to about 200 pounds and reached her highest weight in January 2020 at 572 pounds. Now, despite trialing a variety of different popular weight loss diets during this time, viewers have questioned Amber's authenticity and commitment to her weight loss journey as she continues to steadily gain weight despite repeated efforts to improve her diet and start fresh tomorrow. Now, in addition to her weight loss journey, Amberlynn is also known for her mukbang videos, which have really generated a lot of negative feedback. Critics of Amberlynn are quick to point out some of the contradictions of someone in a larger body seeking weight loss who is simultaneously participating in a trend that encourages eating large volumes of food in one sitting. So this begs the question, are mukbangs okay, acceptable, and fun to watch when the YouTuber is generally thin, healthy, or fit? And are they otherwise disturbing and problematic when the mukbanger's nutritional health is already in question? We're going to be diving deeper into these questions later on in the video, so definitely be sure to stick around for that. Now, with all of that said, many of Amberlynn's viewers have repeatedly expressed concern about her size and the implications that this may have on her health and well-being. Now, I can understand this concern as we do know that obesity, specifically higher amounts of body fat, may put one at a greater risk of a number of chronic diseases, including cancer. Unfortunately, Amberlynn did recently share that she was diagnosed with stage one endometrial cancer, which is a cancer in the lining of the uterus. Now, I will say that there are a number of risk factors for endometrial cancers, including age, genetics, and use of certain forms of contraceptives. But research does suggest that obese and overweight women with higher amounts of body fat are two to four times more likely to develop endometrial cancer. And extremely obese women are about seven times more likely. One explanation for this is that excess fat tissue produces higher amounts of estrogen, which has been associated with not only endometrial cancer, but also breast and ovarian cancers. Another possible explanation is that individuals with higher body fat often have increased blood levels of insulin and insulin-like growth factor one, which may promote the development of some cancers, including endometrial cancer. But of course, 
I am not an oncologist, nor am I part of Amberlynn's healthcare team. So obviously I cannot speak to the root cause of Amberlynn's diagnosis. But what we can say just by looking at the research is that there may be an association between higher body fat and the development of some cancers. Now with that said, since sharing her diagnosis, Amberlynn has also had a hysterectomy to surgically remove the uterus. So I do want to of course wish her a full and safe recovery and remission from her surgery and condition. Now, moving on to her diet, I do wanna start by acknowledging that Amberlynn has shared that she suffers from binge eating disorder and overeating. As usual, it is not my place to speculate about whether or not this is true. And like I said, I am not here to diagnose or pathologize Amberlynn, but rather the purpose of this video is to review the content on her channel at face value in a compassionate and educational format so as to discuss some reoccurring themes like dieting and emotional eating. With that said, I really can't confirm whether or not Amberlynn's What I Eat In A Day videos are an accurate representation of what she actually consumes in a day, but we will talk more about binge eating disorder and dieting later on. For now, I do want to take a brief look at what Amberlynn's typical day of eating might look like at the time of filming this video, which by the way, is subject to change by the time that it's live. Let's start with her breakfast and a quick trigger warning. I'm going to be giving some suggestions on how to help optimize satiety for Amberlynn's weight loss goals. So if this is triggering for you, of course, feel free to skip this section of this video. So for breakfast on day one, we've got a smoothie with Greek yogurt, some frozen berries and some spinach. On day two is a bagel with some chicken breast, cream cheese, and some Cheetos. And on day three, it's some pasta with onion, tomato, corn, pesto, butter, and some sparkling lemonade. So Amberlynn has previously said that she doesn't usually consume stereotypical breakfast, lunch, and dinner meals. Instead, she will usually just eat whatever she feels like in the moment. Great. You know, I don't necessarily think that meals need to look a certain way, based on the time of day that they're consumed. So if that's something that works for her and her palate, then it works for me. With that said, I think there is some room for improvement here to really maximize the nutrition of these meals, which would help keep Amberlynn feeling satisfied longer, potentially curb the desire to binge later on in the day, and boost the disease-fighting antioxidants in her diet for general longevity and health. So for example, she could swap the bag of Cheetos with the smoothie from day one to pair with her bagel breakfast. And this would help cut back on some of the added salt and refined carbs while adding in a serving of fruit, veggies, and extra protein from the Greek yogurt. She could also choose a nice hearty whole grain bread instead of the bagel if she wants some days, which provide a lot more satisfying fiber, protein, and maybe some healthy fats to really keep her energy levels more steady. Also, FYI, when I'm choosing a bread, I do like to look for the words whole grain as the first ingredient in the list. And ideally I'm looking for about three to five grams of fiber and three to six grams of protein per two slices. So that might be a good guideline for Amberlynn as well. Now on day three, I really like that she's got some veggies added to the pasta, but she could definitely shift the proportions, maybe by throwing in some zucchini noodles in with the regular pasta or a few extra handfuls of frozen spinach just to up the fiber content and maybe also add in some tofu or edamame as well especially because a 2015 meta-analysis found that soy intake was associated with 20% lower endometrial cancer risk. She could also swap her pasta for like chickpea pasta because it's got about twice the protein and fiber on average as traditional pasta. But I would say that, you know, just adding in more protein and fiber to her breakfast meals would definitely help keep them a little bit more balanced and up their staying power to keep her feeling more satisfied until lunch. And we know also that a Mediterranean style diet rich in whole grains, fruits, and veggies is associated with lower risk of endometrial cancer. So just something to really keep in mind. Let's take a look at lunch. Okay, so for lunch day one, she's at a restaurant and she has some tilapia with cream sauce, broccoli, and zucchini. Looks so good. Day two is just a Luna bar for lunch. And day three is a second bowl of that pasta she had on day one. 
Now with her lunch on day one, which is the fish and veggies from Ruby Tuesdays, which looks delicious, um, Amber Lynn also mentions that even though this meal was low calorie, it did help her feel full. And I'm really not surprised by this because if you guys remember my hunger crushing combo, we want to aim for a source of fat, protein, and fiber with our meals. So this meal in particular is getting protein from the shrimp and tilapia, fat from the cream sauce, and fiber from the veggies. So super satisfying, I'm sure. And I also love that this meal is not so like overly restrictive. It's not like, you know, plain broiled fish and, and steamed or boiled vegetables. We're getting that cream sauce in there to make it a little bit more satisfying. So that really helps with reducing the idea of kind of mental scarcity as well. On day two, Amber Lynn opts for a Luna bar. And while the Luna bar is a great on the go snack, it's just not likely going to provide enough fuel to get her through to dinner. I mean, literally these have less than 200 calories. The problem is if we let ourselves get too hungry with low calorie meals, we're more likely to overeat whatever we can get our hands on really quick. So even if she didn't have time for a formal sit down meal, she could beef this up with like a handful of nuts, a hard boiled egg and a piece of toast, or some whole grain crackers, hummus, and cut up veggies. So I totally get that Amberlynn may be looking to choose really low calorie meals in an effort to lose weight fast, but choosing meals that are just inadequate is a setup for a binge. So we still wanna think about getting enough calories, particularly from those hunger crushing compounds to get us to that next meal. And then as for day three, Amberlynn has the same pasta that she had for breakfast. So again, we would want to maybe bump up the fiber and ideally get some plant-based protein into this meal to make it more filling and more antioxidant rich. And also maybe just add a little bit more variety. So we could switch up the veggies or serve it with like a green salad to get our veggie fix. Now let's talk about dinner. Okay, so for dinner on day one, we've got four slices of bread with mayo, chicken, and bacon. On day two, it's some macaroni with buffalo chicken sausage and broccoli. And on day three, it's a bowl of cereal, then another bowl of cereal, a few spring rolls, and then six Oreos. So again, we're seeing a variety of different types of meals that don't necessarily fall into the standard dinner category, which is totally okay. And as you guys know, I am not into food rules, even ones that say you can't have cereal for dinner. I mean, like this video right now, if you love breakfast for dinner or like Brinner, <laughs> Brinner, I guess, right? Yes, please. Yes, please. Anyway, so on day one, we've got those sandwiches with mayo, chicken, and bacon. I like that there's more protein in this meal, but we would definitely want to see some veggies or like a simple side salad, just like balance things out. I also think that maybe we could go for either the mayo or bacon since there is already a lot of saturated fat in this meal. And that doesn't mean we need to skimp out on flavor or fat or even reduce the calories. We could totally swap the mayo for like avocado and the bacon for some flavored tempeh to boost up the plant-based protein. This is particularly of interest for Amber Lynn because research suggests that higher saturated fat intakes are associated with increases in endometrial cancer risk by 60 to 80%. All right, so then on day two, we are seeing a little bit more balance. You know, we've got those carbs from the pasta, we've got some protein in the chicken sausage and some veggies in the broccoli. Though again, I would probably shift the proportions just a little bit to see a little bit more green in there. And again, maybe that chickpea pasta would be another easy swap. As for day three, obviously you don't need me to tell you that it's not a super nutritious meal with the Oreos and the spring rolls and two bowls of cereal for dinner. Um, and Amberlynn herself actually mentions that this was a bad eating type of day, which resulted in a bit of a binge that occurred off camera. So saying that we need to boost up the vegetables is kind of a moot point here, um, but we'll be talking a lot more about Amberlynn's emotional eating later on in the video. But again, this may come down to a combination of physical restriction and the experience of emotional scarcity. But stay tuned because we're gonna talk a lot more about that. So in terms of my overall thoughts on Amberlynn's diet, at least based on what we're seeing in these 2020 What I In A Day videos, her portion sizes are not particularly big, 
In fact, at times, they might just not be big enough, and that can set you up for a binge really quickly. But we do have some generally balanced meals to work with. There is, of course, some room to optimize the nutrition in some of Amberlynn's meals, particularly to ensure that she's satiated and then not setting herself up for a binge with inadequate calories at mealtimes, and also to make sure that she's getting in the antioxidants for cancer prevention. So for example, adding in extra nutrition from protein and fiber would help to make her meals more satiating, keeping her blood sugar levels in check, and of course, helping to keep her fuller for longer without adding in a ton of calories, which may potentially reduce the urge to binge later on in the day. Also, focusing on lots of colorful fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, and soy protein may help to reduce her risk of future cancer. But again, these videos are just one piece of the puzzle and may not be an accurate representation of how Amberlynn eats off camera or during an actual binge. Now, one hot topic that I want to get into is mukbangs. And I've shared my thoughts on the mukbang trend, which you can watch right here. But essentially, mukbangs on YouTube have now evolved from the Korean trend of eating a modest amount of food in front of an audience to simulate a social eating experience virtually, to now eating a large quantity of food in a short period of time aka the actual clinical definition of a binge. So obviously to the average viewer, Amberlynn's regular mukbang activity seems at odds with her weight loss goals. And this of course has led to a lot of online bullying, vicious diet trolling, and accusations that she isn't taking her health or weight loss seriously. With that said, Amberlynn has recently shared that she's actively trying to rebrand her channel without doing mukbangs because even though these videos generate the most views, they also generate the most hate and scrutiny. Sounds a lot like what we heard from Nick Okado on his channels as well. Now what I do want to point out, however, especially in contrast to other infamous mukbangers like Nick, is that the volume of food in Amberlynn's mukbangs pale in comparison to the norm. In fact, even though we are seeing some traditional mukbang foods like flaming Cheetos and various high calorie, highly processed fast foods, we're also seeing a lot of less typically bingeable and more balanced meals like veggie stir fry, tuna and celery with rice cakes, veggie burgers, or some meatloaf served with some mac and cheese. And these meals are often even accompanied by a side of veggies or sliced fruit, which let's be real, doesn't really satisfy a viewer's desire to live vicariously through a YouTuber's epic cheat meal. So Amberlynn's mukbangs are, dare I say, healthier than most YouTubers all in 10,000 calorie challenges. But yet, if you compare the comment sections of her mukbangs compared to many others, like let's say Always Hungry, Amber Lynn bears the brunt of the disgust and hate. Let's just look at one of the most popular comments on Amber Lynn's mukbang versus one from lifestyle YouTuber Always Hungry. Both of these people post about wanting to get or stay fit, but the primary difference is that Livia Adams from Always Hungry is already in a socially desirable body and Amber Lynn is not. So why does someone's body size influence our perception about whether or not mukbangs are acceptable? And why is eating any amount of food that is not considered diet food not socially acceptable from somebody in a larger body? Here's the thing. I am by no means condoning mukbang videos of any kind, even the more modest versions on Amberlynn's channel. I honestly think that this is a really problematic YouTube trend that perpetuates a lot of disordered eating behaviors. But these behaviors are unhealthy regardless of size. Repeatedly eating large amounts of highly processed foods in one sitting can lead to increased blood pressure and blood sugar, water retention, shifts in one's gut microflora, and dysregulated mood. But it's very clear that the negative public perception of Amberlynn's content is unique because of her size. And that's nothing new. 
Research suggests that society's negative attitudes towards obese people play a significant role in their psychological and their physical health. I get that a lot of people think that trolling an obese person about their weight or offering like aggressive dieting advice might motivate these individuals to adopt healthier behaviors, but statistically, the opposite is true. Research shows that the experience of weight stigma reduces exercise frequency and increases binge eating, unhealthy weight control behaviors, and binge eating disorder. In fact, one study on more than 2,400 overweight and obese women reported that 79% of participants coped with weight stigma by eating more food, and 75% of participants coped by refusing to change their diet. In addition, weight stigma can also cause psychological stress, which can increase the risk of depression, low self-esteem, and body dissatisfaction. So you can see how this experience may actually perpetuate some of these unhealthy, destructive behaviors. So are internet trolls the reason for Amberlynn's extreme weight gain since she started her journey online? Well, according to the research, and simply by looking at the comment section of even just one of her videos, I would say that this is a real possibility. And considering that Amberlynn's weight gain and mukbang behavior has become so ingrained in her online identity, she might feel that it's understandably a really difficult pattern to break. Now, while my own personal and professional experiences see mukbangs as often really problematic, I'm also totally open to the possibility that they may play a therapeutic role for Amber Lynn. In one of her videos, Amberlynn mentions that eating in front of the camera just actually increases her awareness around what she's eating and allows her to eat at a more slow pace and a more mindful pace compared to how she might eat off camera, which is usually in front of the television. Because of this, she states that she actually often ends up eating less on camera compared to when she's eating when nobody's watching. And there's a few reasons why this might be. For one, it may be that her audience gives her a sense of accountability with her weight loss goals. Now, accountability is an important element in a lot of weight loss programs and also in eating disorder recovery plans in an effort to maintain some structure around food and normal eating behaviors. In the context of disordered eating behaviors, which is what I would characterize some of the mukbang binging to simulate, the feeling of being watched by followers on YouTube is kind of similar to what might happen in real eating disorder recovery programs where meals are supervised by a member of your treatment team. We also know that most eating disorder behaviors happen in private, so it is statistically unlikely that she would invite us, the viewer, to witness an extreme binging episode. Now, the other potential benefit of the mukbang format is that Amberlynn herself suggests that eating for the camera encourages her to eat more mindfully and slowly, both of which are healthy eating practices. So research suggests that eating slowly without distractions allows your body more time to release satiety hormones. In contrast, eating while distracted, like watching TV or on your phone, can lead to faster eating and eating past the point of fullness. In fact, one study found that TV watching while eating increased food intake by up to 71%. Research has also shown that mindfulness can be a useful tool to reduce emotional eating and the frequency of binge eating episodes, both of which Amberlynn claims she struggles with. So one study found that obese women doing mindfulness exercises decreased their binge eating episodes from four times a week to one to two times a week. That is powerful stuff. So I can't say that mukbangs are a hindrance to Amberlynn's weight loss efforts, and it's very possible that the blatant weight stigma and trolling in the comment sections of these videos play a larger role. But is an online troll really the only cause of such a dramatic shift in weight over time? So I want to talk about some of the other potential contributing factors to Amberlynn's public weight gain. According to Amberlynn, she's been classified as overweight for as long as she can remember and was just 11 years old when she first went on a diet. So since then, she says that weight loss is kind of on her mind 24 seven, and she really doesn't know what life is like without worrying about her weight. 
She even has a video where she lists a hundred reasons why she wants to lose weight, which includes things like reducing her risk of disease, as well as engaging in seemingly normal experiences like dancing, traveling, and walking on the beach. So despite people's skepticism of Amber Lynn, I think it's pretty clear that weight loss is something that she strongly desires, and she recognizes that her weight gain does have implications for her quality of life. So why is weight loss so hard for Amber Lynn to achieve? Well, according to the literature, it can be really challenging for a lot of people to achieve and maintain weight loss long-term. Even the most liberal research tells us that most people who engage in intentional weight loss behaviors, on average, lose and maintain no more than six to 10% of their weight. So for somebody who is overweight or obese, they will likely remain in these categories after their maximum realistic amount of weight loss is achieved. We also know that there's a high rate of weight regain after a period of significant weight loss, also known as weight cycling. So one study found that individuals typically regain 30 to 35% of their weight a year later, and will often regain most of the weight or more within five years. This may be one reason why Amberlynn regained the weight that she lost, those 89 pounds, and continues to gain more. This is not to say that it's impossible to sustain long-term weight loss. You can find tons of examples of people who do it every day, and I do believe absolutely that it can be done. However, the data tells us that maintaining significant weight loss for over five years is more of an exception rather than the rule. With that said, obesity is a complex issue and cannot simply be resolved by eating less and exercising more. If it were that simple, we probably wouldn't be seeing Amberlynn going on a diet after a diet to lose weight only to regain it back. Also, putting oneself on really restrictive diets in an effort to lose weight often sets one up for a future binge. And Amberlynn herself has confessed that stages of restriction and deprivation often trigger her to binge and overeat. This is why the new obesity guidelines suggest that rather than suggesting somebody just eat less to weigh less, it's more important to focus more on the root cause of an individual's weight gain and healthy behaviors that they can actually sustain. Now, one of the many reasons why just eating less doesn't always work is that food is often used as an ineffective coping mechanism to soothe negative emotions. So Amberlynn's documentation of her emotional eating episodes are often peppered with depressive episodes and follow along the typical cycle of guilt, shame, regret, and fear of losing control. This is why one of the first steps to dealing with emotional eating is to help identify and differentiate physical and emotional hunger while working with your therapy team to really find other effective coping mechanisms to help manage those emotions. I talk about this in a lot more detail in my video on emotional eating, which you can watch right here. However, I just wanna summarize the differences between emotional hunger and physical hunger. Physical hunger develops gradually, whereas emotional hunger comes on usually pretty suddenly or abruptly, often accompanied by some kind of really strong emotion. Emotional hunger often also can drive you towards one specific food, whereas physical hunger often is a little bit more flexible and more open to what's available. Physical hunger often has a clear endpoint, so you're usually able to experience the onset of fullness and take it as a cue to stop eating. Whereas when you're eating out of emotional hunger, it's often more difficult to feel satisfied or full. And when you don't, it often triggers further feelings of guilt and shame. Now, before we dive deeper into these topics with Alessandra, I want to talk about Amberlynn's current weight loss plan since reaching her highest weight of 572 pounds in January. So in an effort to continue to lose weight and with the weight loss goal of 400 pounds, Amberlynn has flirted with Weight Watchers, Noom, and intuitive eating. But outside of diet attempts, her focus has been on curbing her binge eating episodes, all of which have collectively helped her lose close to 90 pounds. Now, it's important to mention that for Amber Lynn, these episodes are not just benign binges that can you know, easily be overcome and forgotten about at the next meal or snack. 
there can actually be a difference between a binge and what Amberlynn has been diagnosed with, which is binge eating disorder. So to dive more into these topics, I've once again invited my colleague, eating disorder dietitian, Alessandra Magisano, to provide her insight and expertise on the subject. Thank you again for joining me, Alessandra. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be back. So what is the difference between a binge and binge eating disorder? Okay, so great question. The main difference between the two of them is essentially clinical criteria um, or diagnostic criteria. So a binge eating disorder um, is um, a mental health condition that can be technically diagnosed and it follows very specific uh, quantitative measurements. So things like eating a certain amount of food in a specific amount of time, um, generally larger than someone would eat uh, comparably to, to, to you. And it also involves some qualitative measurements like feeling guilty, feeling uncomfortably full, eating when not hungry, things like that. But it's more quantitative in terms of recurrent episodes of binge eating at least once a week, they say, in the past three months. Whereas a binge, first of all, could be on something other than food. And it's more subjective in nature. It, it can be more subjective. So someone can eat a cupcake and feel like it's a binge, and that mm. is completely valid. So that's the main difference between them. They're very similar, really almost identical. The only difference is one kind of is clinical and checks off boxes, and the other one can actually be more subjective and takes into consideration more qualitative uh, components. Amazing. Good to know. Um, and regardless of diagnosis, what are some strategies to help kind of curb overeating and those binge cycles? The main number one strategy for both is meal regulation. So whenever someone is experiencing either overeating cycles or binge eating cycles, it is because of some element of chao what we call chaotic eating or eating that either doesn't satisfy enough physically or emotionally mm. or mentally so we want to look at it's widely known that binging comes from some element of restriction that's thankfully now pretty well known um, but there's this other component of mental restriction that is less often understood and that's what I like to focus on with my clients as well is this idea that your meal regulation is not just about going through the motions of eating enough food quantitatively but it's also about feeling satisfied and feeling like it's it's um, enough and that you're fueling yourself often and one of the biggest struggles that I see in, in my clients is they often ask me, okay, but I'm working on my overeating, but I feel like I'm eating more. You're telling me to eat too much. And that's the biggest struggle because ultimately it feels like they're eating more when really we're taking away the mm. binging and we're taking away maybe the grazing. And the most important thing is we're taking away the mindless eating that they weren't even aware they were doing. Right. So they don't really count that. But when I'm like, okay, for lunch, have a sandwich and some veggies and hummus and a piece of fruit, they're like, that's a lot of food. That's a lot of food. But it does, it feels like it is because it's mindful, intentional. So that's really the main strategy when we want to curb is meal regulation and satisfaction. Amazing. Great tips. And in your opinion, why do a lot of weight loss diets fail individuals who suffer from binge eating disorder? Well, I think weight loss diets fail everybody. And and I think in one, re one way they really are unfair to people who suffer from binge eating disorder and, and overeating though, mm -hmm. is because they're often, uh, again, there's this stigma of the, that binge eating and overeating is about eating too much, a mm -hmm. loss of control and no willpower. So weight loss diets offer this wonderful solution to just kind of fixing that, but it fails them ultimately because it's not about, um, it's about deprivation. Again, not just physically, but mental deprivation but it pulls on their heartstrings of you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. Like you're just not doing it right. Like if the diet didn't work, you, you eat too much. That's the problem. So it, it, it really, it, they, it really is hard on them because they're disadvantaged in terms of the stigma of binge eating and, and overeating, for example. So insightful. And is there often a focus on weight loss when treating people with binge eating disorders, or is this just like too triggering for the most part? 
definitely too triggering. It's a very much um, counterindicated. So we would mm. never uh, focus on weight loss at all, at, at least at the beginning stages of treatment. So just like how we would with someone who was suffering from anorexia or, or bulimia or any other type of, of eating disorder, we wouldn't, weight loss cannot happen in recovery mm -hmm. in terms of that can't be the focus of the goal because often remember it's the symptom, right? Like wanting weight loss is a part of the symptom. It doesn't mean it can't happen or can't be addressed, but it needs to happen within the process in order for it to, to, to work. Otherwise it is too triggering and it gets in the way because then it's just about, okay, but like it, the progress is about weight loss, which um, negates all the other indicators that we try and um, focus on when it comes to recovery. And how could somebody theoretically with binge eating disorder um, who is at a higher weight is it possible for them to safely lose weight without feeling restricted? And how would that happen? It is possible. The number one way it happens is time. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a long time and you have to go through the process. Mm -hmm. So it's uncomfortable, but they have to go through the process of understanding where the binge eating came from to begin with. Um, because oftentimes what I find is when you cut, when they start the process, it's like, okay, weight loss, uh, that's what I, I, I don't feel comfortable with my body. I want to lose weight. And I hear them and I validate that. But once we go through the actual process of recovery and healing the relationship with food and therefore body, mm -hmm. their idea of weight loss changes. So it's not necessarily that they completely give it up or that we don't touch it again, but it, we change together the definition of that. We might focus on, okay, well, what does weight loss mean for you? What does health mean for you? Is it about a size. Oftentimes those kinds of things are what they would say at the beginning. Mm. It's about a gene size or it's about looking a certain way in clothes. When, when you go through the process, it, the definition changes to something a little bit more holistic mm. and that's how it can safely be done because then their mindset is shifted to something much healthier than, than just a, a body size mm. alone. So it's, it can be done safely. It just has to be done over time and um, with the right unpacking along the way. And so could somebody with binge eating disorder ever get to the place of being able to eat intuitively? Absolutely. I see it all the time. It, it's one of the most amazing things that can happen from binge eating disorder that is like pretty chaotic in eating. You can go and eat really, really intuitively. It just, again, takes time and trust because ultimately it's a relationship that's, that's broken and we just have to heal it. And once your relationship with your body is healed and you practice, that's the other thing I tell my clients, you've got to practice. It's not perfect. You're going to have days where you don't eat intuitively because, you know, you're busy at work and you know you need to eat and you're maybe not really hungry but you know you have to that's not really intuitive but it kind of is because you know you need it in the bigger scheme of things so these are the ways that we talk about intuitive eating we make it practical and absolutely anyone can eat intuitively and do you see success with implementing like mindfulness strategies for people who have binge eating disorder and mm -hmm. like what would be the most effective mm -hmm. mindfulness is absolutely absolutely number one, very effective. Um, and ultimately it's effective because it forces the client to be aware of the present moment, which is usually the opposite of what's happening when they're overeating or they're binge eating. Even if they're aware, cause some clients will say like, oh, I'm pretty aware I'm binge eating. Even so there's a disconnection with your body. So mindfulness kind of brings that all to the surface. So it's things like um, unpacking, you know, your triggers, environmental triggers, um, we, you know, figuring out, do we have to reposition things in your, in your um, kitchen? Do we have to reposition where you sit at the table, screen time, bowls, portioning, um, all those kinds of things help to bring mindfulness to the surface, as well as tons of journaling. So that helps. Um, at the beginning, I'll have, you know, clients write a ton of notes um, around their meal times. I'm less concerned with their logging of the food and more about the context around it because that's the mindfulness piece. And so it's very important and very effective. Amazing. Okay, and finally, what are some strategies to help reduce that emotional eating component that may contribute to binge eating, of course, in addition to therapy? Mm -hmm. so, um, so like I mentioned, journaling is very, very helpful. But again, it's this idea of just tuning in to your body's cues. So I like to use introspective awareness a lot with my clients and asking them, you know, 
how do you, can we, can we listen to your heartbeat, your pulse? You know, how do you know you have to go to the bathroom, your bladder being full? Do you ever question that? And they're like, no. And I'm like, okay, well, let's get, that's where I want you to get with food. Or you don't question it. Your body says, gives you a message and you just do it. So that's what we're working towards. And there's little strategies that, um, that, I, that I, I, I work with clients on to work towards that. Um, things like hunger scales um, to figure out where am I in terms of hunger before a meal, middle of the meal, after a meal, just to compare over time. Um, and also things like grounding techniques I find very, very effective. So similar to the mindfulness stream, um, I pull from DBT, uh, dialectical behavior therapy um, modalities, where they talk about using grounding and using your senses as a means to ground and calm anxiety. In, in DBT, they use it for anxiety. So sometimes I use it when we have urges for binging. So we might kind of together figure out, okay, well, which of your of the five senses do you identify strongest? And if someone says, you know what, I just touch is really important to me. We might think of something that they can use as a, as a touch mechanism to have with them when they are experiencing an urge or when they're coping through something like fuzzy blankets or, um, you know, like a squishy ball or a fidget spinner or things like that. Um, and any of the senses can have these, these very powerful tactile grounding techniques and strategies. So we create kind of like a uh, an urge toolkit using using these strategies so that when people go into situations that are very stressful um, around food or even when they're at home do, dealing with a meal time, you can go towards this to curb the emotion because whenever we got emotion, we just got to ground and get um, and get present. And so what about those clients who say, I know I'm hungry, I know I'm full, but I'm what do I do about the times where I'm hungry for the wrong foods? Mm -hmm. Great question. So my answer to that would be, let's figure out why you think they're wrong foods, right? Because that goes back to the mental restriction then. So even though you might say like, okay, I'm, I, I, I just want, I want the bad foods. The reason you want them is because you think that they're bad. There's a lot of emotional energy that gets charged when we have to think that something is bad. So, you know, I get this question all the time. They're like, but there are foods, aren't there foods that people just shouldn't eat? Like, how can you be a dietitian and tell me that okay. like there aren't foods, right? I'm sure you hear it too. Oh yeah, all the time. Uh, aren't there foods that we just shouldn't eat? And I say, you know, like, of course there is gentle nutrition. Of course there's foods you should have more often, etc. But the energy that you spend trying to villainize those foods takes away from your decision in that moment to make another choice. So you don't have to choose that food, but I also don't, you don't have to hate it. I mean, let's just neutralize it. So if you know when you're hungry, know when you're full, but you just want the bad foods, it's because you're thinking about bad foods. It has too much power and potentially you're not getting enough um, food also during the day, right? Like if you're craving somewhere, usually the first thing we look at with cravings is you're not eating enough. Um, but when you are, and there's the physical component satisfied, then we look emotional and we say, well, then you're probably thinking that it's bad and that's why you want it. So let's do some exposure therapy. Right. It's kind of the difference between, um, kind of, uh, physical restriction and emotional scarcity that, that same, yes. same kind of mentality. Yes. Mm. Yes, yes. And it's a, it's, a, it's a fine line between a restriction and a boundary. Yeah. And that's ultimately what recovery is about, is learning what is a boundary and what is a restriction and knowing that one is flexible and one is inflexible. And that's mm. the difference. Love that. Flexible and inflexible. That is so helpful. Uh, thank you again so much, Alessandra, for providing so much helpful insights. And once again, everyone, I'm going to be leaving all of our contact information in the description below so that you can reach out if you're looking for some one-on-one -on -one support. So thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you again to Alessandra for providing her helpful insights. So once again, I'm going to be leaving all of her contact information below if you need to reach out for some one-on-one -on -one support. Okay. So again, the intention of this review is not to diagnose or pathologize Amber Lynn, but to use her content for educational purposes to provide you with helpful insights and knowledge on emotional eating and the complicated world of obesity, weight stigma, and binge eating disorder. I also want to strongly remind you to please be kind in the comments, both here and on Amberlynn's channel. Your words are so powerful, so please use them wisely. 
We ultimately cannot know what somebody is going through off camera. So I really do ask you guys to consider if your comments are helpful or supportive, or if they contribute to the weight stigma and discrimination that people in larger bodies are so often subjected to. And on that note, that is all for today's video. If you liked it, be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below with who you'd like to see me review next. Subscribe to the channel and I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.